I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free words. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, coming to you from London with an audience of distinguished experts and one or two enthusiastic amateurs like me. We're talking about Jeremy Corbyn. Some of you in our audience may not have heard of him. So let me give you a short pen portrait. Jeremy Corbyn was a lifelong, long-serving parliamentarian sitting on the back benches, never allowed before anywhere near the levers of power, either in government or in opposition. He was a rebel MP for all the right reasons. He supported Palestine. He opposed wars against Iraq, against Libya, against Afghanistan, <coughs> and against Syria. He opposed British renewal of nuclear weapons. He opposed the Anglo-American alliance everywhere it reared its ugly head. He stood up for workers, workers on strike, workers who were poor. He stood up for the disabled, for marginalized groups of all kinds. He stood up for women and uh, minorities of all kinds. He stood up for those who had no power, and he was not listened to. Labour had a long, dark night under the leadership of someone you will know well, Tony Blair. Jeremy Corbyn was one of his most inveterate opponents, and Blair kept him on the very back of the back benches. The proximate cause of Jeremy Corbyn becoming the leader of the Labour Party was Tony Blair. Not just because Blair bankrupted Labour and Britain of all credibility with his conduct with George W. Bush in the Iraq War, but perhaps even more importantly because Blair and the so-called centrist politics that he represented indeed championed and led, have led to the immiseration of millions of people in Britain, have led to the atomization of the British working class to the point where 13 million of our people, out of 65 million, are living officially in poverty, where 7 million of our children are living officially in poverty, where 2 millions of our people are living in food banks for their daily nutritional needs. Charity is feeding a substantial number of the British people. Jeremy Corbyn opposed the neoliberal austerity politics of Tony Blair. And so when Labour came crashing to its knees in 2015, when the post-Blair and Brown leadership of Ed Miliband took Labour down to just 29% of the popular vote in Britain, the members had a choice. They were at a crossroads. Do they go further and further down the road that parties like them all across Europe had gone and into oblivion? Or did they strike out in an entirely new direction? And that's what they chose to do. Since when all hell has broken loose, Jeremy Corbyn has been the recipient of a tidal wave, a tsunami of deep state subversion, state-sponsored propaganda, and smeared, slandered, defamed, and lied about at every turn. He's been accused of being a Soviet agent, a KGB spy, a Czech spy. He's been accused of being a friend of Hezbollah, a friend of Hamas, a friend of Irish terrorism, 
There is nothing, frankly, that he has not been accused of. And yet, it hasn't made any difference. When, when Britain faced an unexpected general election, two years into Corbyn's leadership, just last year, he shocked the political establishment to its core by leading Labour to its best result since 1945, imagine, transforming the Labour vote from 29% to 40%, and but for a very few thousand votes in the right places, we would have been talking about Jeremy Corbyn, Prime Minister, today. Just imagine that. The Israel lobby has been the most active of all the vested interests opposed to Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. The Israel lobby, indeed the Israeli embassy in London itself, was caught red-handed on camera, subverting not just Jeremy Corbyn actually, but the entire British political system, plotting to bring down even conservative ministers because they were not thought subservient enough to Benjamin Netanyahu. The Israel lobby has had its hand in all the events of this summer, where Jeremy Corbyn came under the most deadly assault of all, the foul slander of anti-Semitism. A man, Corbyn, who had opposed racism in all its forms, all of his life, was painted as if he were standing in his private moments in a Nazi uniform. I'm not exaggerating. He was transformed by the media into an existential threat to the existence of Jewish people in Britain. It's hard to conjure up a more foul slander than that. But so common has that slander become that no one even thinks now about suing over it. Because if you tell a lie often enough, well, enough people might just believe it. Whether Corbyn can survive as the Labour leader and if he can ever become the British Prime Minister is what we will be discussing today. And if he did become Prime Minister, what kind of Britain would be the result? Not that everything's rosy in the Jeremy Corbyn garden, Many think, and I'm one of them, that he has not fought the challenge, for example, from the Israel lobby, either well enough, hard enough, or in the right way, or early enough. Some think he should be more voluble on many things, including NATO, including the role of the United States in different parts of the world, like the Ukraine, uh, like uh, Syria, I think that Jeremy Corbyn is a good man, but I'm not here to claim he's the saviour. Let's kick off the debate with a well-known uh, journalist in London, Ahmed Caballo. Ahmed, where do you think Corbyn and Britain now stand? What has he done right? What has he done wrong? OK, what he's done right was during the general election, we saw a guy that thought, I've got nothing to lose, I'm going to be unapologetically myself, the reason that the Labour membership were energised, the reason so many people joined the Labour Party. But since then, to me, he's, he's retreated. And I feel like the, the biggest problem we've got at the moment is there's a civil war going on. The grassroots in members... In the Labour Party. In the Labour Party. The grassroots members... Just, we're speaking to people who know what a real civil war is. <laughs> Sorry. A civil, a civil war within the Labour Party. Grassroots members, like Mark Wadsworth, know we're in a civil war. In fact, he's got many wounds from this civil war. Everybody on the Twitter sphere that supports Jeremy Corbyn knows we're in this civil war. But yet we have the leadership that seems to be in denial and seems to think that with your enemies, you can just kind of put your fingers in your ear and pretend like it's not happening. Well, I'm afraid it is happening. It's not going to go away. It's time to stand up and fight because 
many people like myself join the Labour Party because we, we believed in you. Don't let us down, Jeremy. Don't let the country down. This is bigger than Jeremy Corbyn being the next Prime Minister. This is about the heart and soul, not just the Labour Party, but of Britain. Are we going to have an illusion of democracy between a right-wing party and a centre-right, Blair right-wing party? Or are we really going to have a choice between a different style of government, a different future, a, a state-owned society where we, where we have public investment in things like education, in the NHS? Are we going to go down this neoliberal nightmare that's led us to where we are today? Mark Wadsworth, you were uh, for many, many decades a leading black activist, a writer, a journalist, an anti-racism campaigner, a friend of Jeremy Corbyn, who was his friend when not that many others were. Well, you were. I was, and you were, but we were few in number then. You sit here today as an expelled member of the Labour Party, as a man, if you'll forgive me using this word, lynched, politically lynched, by the Israel lobby, and not many people lifted a finger to help you. How does that feel? Well, it's tough. I've been buoyed up by the amount of support around the country, overwhelming support. There was a poll done online by a political website, which wasn't a Corbynista website, uh, 3,000 people polled, 97% 97 of people saying I should be reinstated into the party. I've suffered a political calumny, a libel against me, as you've described against Jeremy Corbyn, where you say if you tell a lie enough, enough times, then that lie sets in and becomes the common orthodoxy. I am not an anti-Semite. I got up at a meeting at the launch of the report by Shami Chakrabarti into anti-Semitism and all forms of racism, and I had the temerity to challenge a right-wing anti-Corbyn MP who I saw working hand-in-hand -hand with the Daily Telegraph, a reporter from the Daily Telegraph, against Jeremy Corbyn. But that was an aside. I just mentioned that as an aside. What I was really talking about was the underrepresentation of African, Caribbean, and Asian uh, people in that room and in positions of influence within the Labour Party. Not just black MPs, black faces in high places. I'm talking about people with clout. And Jeremy actually supported me in what I said. But what was latched upon by the right wing, rabid media that I challenged unwittingly? A Jewish MP. I didn't know Ruth Smith was Jewish. Didn't particularly care. The important point was this attack on Jeremy Corbyn. This was in 2016, after the chicken coup, when 172 right-wing MPs signed a motion of no confidence in Jeremy. But I'm buoyed up by the support. In a sense, people have said, you're the leader of the resistance from the rank and file because everyone can see the injustice that you have suffered. Uh, it would have been nice if I'd have had support at the top. Uh, maybe those people at the top feel they can't support, they've got bigger fish to fry. Let's see how this pans out, because we just heard now, this is a fight for the soul of the Labour Party and the nation. Just uh, clarify something for us. When they say anti-Semitism, and I've given up even, because this phrase has been bankrupted of meaning. If, if someone like Corbyn, if someone like you, if someone like I can be called an anti-Semite, that phrase means nothing. Because the idea that people like us could hate people because of their religion or because of their ethnicity is so absurdly far from the truth that, frankly, oftentimes I no longer even fight against it. When they call us anti-Semites, what they mean is we are anti-Zionists. When they say we're against Jews, what they mean is we're against Israel. 
when they say we're against this religion of Judaism, we say we love Jews. We just hate Zionism, which is a political ideology, a colonialist ideology, an apartheid ideology in practice in Palestine today. Isn't that case? I'll tell you what I hate. The oppression of the Palestinians, many of whom are my colour. In fact, all of them are my colour. And so I think we have to look at it in that context. The things that have gone here, on, on here that are very dishonest. Anti-Semitism. Let's look at that term. Ethiopians are Semites. Eritreans. Somalians. Palestinians. What we're talking about, if we want to have an honest debate, is hatred of Jews as a faith. That's not happening in the Labour Party. There are some people on Twitter, on social media, that are nutcases. Conspiracy theorists. They're against you and me. They're all right. They're not necessarily members of the Labour Party. So this has been spun. There have been false allegations maliciously used as a weapon, that's what my Jewish socialist comrade friends have told me, as a weapon against Jeremy Corbyn and his pro progressive politics and his supporters like you and me. I think we need to have an honest debate because what's really happening in Britain is attacks on black people, anti-black racism, Islamophobia. It's rampant. And yet where are the voices in support of, of us? Where are the voices on Windrush outside a very narrow debate about compensation to people like who would have been my father's generation. My father was on the Windrush. Unfortunately, he died. He came to this country, uh, to Britain, to fight in the Second World War as a 17-year-old volunteer from Jamaica. So let's focus on youth-on-youth -youth violence, where our young black men are dying daily in the streets. Let's focus on deaths in custody, where young black, largely males, are being murdered by the police. Let's focus on homelessness, on uh, the food bank issue that you talked about, uh, on uh, uh, black students not being able to get black subjects on the, subje uh, on the curriculum. These are issues that we should be campaigning on, not this just very narrow issue that we've been corralled into by a faction, and we know who's behind that faction. What would uh, Britain be like under Jeremy Corbyn? Steve Topple, you are uh, a star a rising star of the British journalistic firmament. You're not a Labour member. You don't even vote Labour. And you're not here as a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. But you'd have to concede, wouldn't you, that uh, the Britain we have today would be rather different if Jeremy Corbyn was in Downing Street. Uh, indeed. Look, I mean, my position on this is fairly clear. I'm not a Labour supporter or a Labour member, as you know. Um, however, there's no getting around the fact that, of course, if uh, Corbyn led or Corbyn, if you like, imitation government, because Jeremy Corbyn isn't going to be leader forever of the Labour Party, if that kind of ideology came in, then, of course, it would be beneficial. Um, it, it, I suppose the debate surrounds um, how far he would actually take it, because we all know that, obviously, if Corbyn and Labour got into government, they would be constricted somewhat by the civil service. We, we see a mimicking of that happening in America, as um, you and I have discussed before, with Trump being affected by the deep state and, and what he does. Um, but I think, of course, there's any positives to be said for a Corbyn government. Whether he goes far enough for my own personal liking um, is debatable. But, yeah, of course, um, you have to be overtly supportive of Corbyn. And I think as anyone who's on the left as well, regardless of whether you agree with all of Corbyn's politics, when another member of the left is being attacked, then your natural instinct should be to stick up for them, of course. Am I right that the proximate cause of Corbyn is Blair? Yeah, I'd say that's pretty accurate. I, I, I think it's slightly bigger than that in terms of, the, as you noted in your introduction, we've seen across Europe this backlash against centrist politics, if you like. It's yes, gone. but in those countries, the backlash has been to the right. Yeah. In Britain, oddly, 
it's been to the left. Well, we say it's been to the left. I mean, the largest group in the 2017 general election for any political party was the people who didn't vote, um, as we well know. And if you look at the swing um, to Labour in 2017, the swing in the working classes, that is socio-economic statuses, C to D and E, the poorest groups in Britain, the swing to the Conservatives was larger, 12%, than it was to Labour at 7%. So while the swing has been more to the left in this country, admittedly, and more to the right in Europe... I think it's a backlash against, backlash against Blair, but it's a backlash against that whole sort of era from the late 90s of this triangulation, if you like, of left and right politics into this sort of hodgepodge of centralism, which came with a very thin veneer of political correctness and a very thin veneer of equality for all. But actually, it was just a continuation of the neoliberalism of the 80s from Thatcher and Reagan. In a sentence, because we're out of time for the first segment, you live on a, a council housing estate, that is, houses provided by the state, overwhelmingly poor, the working poor included, people who work but don't earn enough uh, to be out of poverty. How is Jeremy Corbyn seen there? A uh, muted silence. That's a brief, commendably brief <laughs> sentence. You asked. We'll be back right after this. With me, George Galloway, coming to you from London, discussing the leader of the British Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. Can he become Prime Minister of Britain? Will it be allowed by the deep state that he should become Prime Minister of Britain? And if he did, what kind of Britain would it be? We took the Kalamohora cameras onto the streets of London to ask the people what they thought. Take a look at this. Some people said that there's been an onslaught against Corbyn. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, probably to some extent. Yeah, I think you know he's easy to attack. You know, people call him a communist and stuff like that. So, you know, and that's not really true exactly, is it? So, I think he gets more credit than he deserves. The uh, the media seem to put him up there in a way, as if to say, um, his behaviour and the way he acts is perfectly appropriate. I think uh, I think he's I think he's appalling. Truthfully, I think he's scum. I can't, can't stand Jeremy Corbyn. I think there is an onslaught against him, but I think it's kind of rightfully, rightfully so in some ways. But that's because I'm not a fan of him. What do you think about the way Jeremy Corbyn's been treated in the media? Do you think it's been fair? There's no doubt that the so-called print medium, what we used to call newspapers, now available, of course, mostly online, are dominated by right-wing views in this country. I think, yeah, I think the mainstream media do not... They have, like, an axe to grind against Jeremy Corbyn. And... And I think, I think maybe if you're somebody who lives by what they, you know, he's, he's not ashamed to defend things that he's said in the past that might be controversial, or at least to defend his right to have thought that at one point. What do you think about Jeremy Corbyn's media coverage? Has it been fair? And has it affected the way you think of him? Um, not so much. I try and avoid mainstream media in general, so, like... Well, like, at least get my opinions from the whole range of political sort of opinions. So, um, no, I, yeah, I wouldn't say my opinion's been changed too much by media. But for many other people, it probably has, you know. As far as influencing me is concerned, I study the media. They're things that really interest me, so I'm obsessed with them. But whether they control the way I think, I doubt. But then almost everybody would tell you they're independent of what the media tells them. When an elite like the media, the mainstream media, start telling me to think something, I tend to just think the opposite. Well, apart from the Rangers man, note to international audience, Google Glasgow Rangers FC, uh, all the uh, people there polled by our camera uh, seem to have a fairly good handle on what's going on, whatever their point of view was. Where do you stand on this, sir? 
Um, well, with me and uh, with Jeremy Corbyn, um, I think he's done a great job in rebuilding Labour to from where it was. He's tripled the size of yeah. the party for he's, a start. On brand Labour alone, he's done uh, a lot in rebuilding it's the that. the biggest left of yeah. centre party in the entire Western world. Definitely, definitely. Um, the only thing I'd like to add with his uh, political situation, um, with uh, the, the anti-Semitism and uh, all these things he's accused of, um, like I myself, I'm from Luton, from that very famous area that always seems to be on the news now, um, where the BNP... And Let's the explain that to people. Um, Luton has a very large Muslim population. That's right. That's right. It also has uh, quite a large white right wing that's correct. Many would argue racist mm -hmm. uh, uh, population, mm -hmm. and quite often it's in the news when these two things come together. And that's Just right. Just explaining for the That's right. It, it's, it's basically, what, when I was there, there was like two parts of town. There was one place called Hound Regis, which is where I was from, which is where a lot of the right-wingers may live and that, but they lived amongst me. Um, I did see problems, a lot of problems, you know, BNP and National Front in that area. These are right-wing British parties. That's correct, yeah. And... Um, there was the other side, which is like Lee Grave, Bury Park. Uh, that's where the Muslim sector was generally. Um, there wasn't, didn't tend to be too many problems before. Uh, it was just now and again, a little bit here and then. How is Corbyn seen in Luton? Ah, oh, in Luton, um, probably, probably, uh, probably received quite well from the Muslim community. I'd say he's, he's quite popular amongst the Muslim community. Um, I mean, he's in trouble if that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> but, but with this thing with the anti-Semitism, I mean, I've, I've seen, like I said, problems uh, with racism from the, the National Front BNP. I've also lived in North London, Cricklewood, Wilsden. I live near Brixton in Streatham now. So I've seen all types of violence and problems in society. But I've never seen any problems with Jews and another section of society. That's never happened. I've been to, you know, a lot of the rough schools and well, isn't colleges. Well, is the, 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 the Jewish people who do receive overt racism mm. and even violence are the ultra-Orthodox Jews in the eastern part of London mm -hmm. who overwhelmingly support Jeremy Corbyn and oppose Israel. That's right. Isn't that true? That's right, yeah. Because people can see that they're Jews. That's right. And they don't like the other. And they, they're venomous towards the other, whether the other is a Sikh, a Muslim, or an Orthodox Jew, isn't that the case? Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much. Um, I mean, the, the only thing I'd like to add to that, I mean, in terms of our place as England, we, we tend to have good relations with Jewish people, like same with everyone else, we're, we're very tolerant here. There's never been problems, if, if anything, they've been the most successful society in this country, I'd say. They've got roads named after them and all sorts of things and premises and well, uh, but yeah. there has been anti-Semitism against Jews in Britain in the past. There has uh, been, yeah, of course. There have been massacres in the distant past. In the distant years past, ago. yeah. Uh, and there was anti-Semitism openly uh, in British society right up until other people took their place. Yeah, uh, uh, of Until anti-Irish racism, anti-black racism, anti-Muslim racism. That's exactly it. Took their, uh, took their place. That's correct. But you're right. Uh, I mean, there are at least two friends of mine in this room who are Jewish, but you couldn't tell that they were Jewish yeah. because uh, they look and dress and act exactly uh, like the rest of us. That's correct. They're both supporters of Jeremy Corbyn, That's correct. I should say. Let's take this lady here uh, from Manchester, mm -hmm. come down from the north for this show. You're a supporter of Corbyn. Certainly am, yeah. Tell me why. Well, I was, I was sorry, you know, Mark, Mark. listening very, very carefully because that's my views exactly. Islamophobia. Yeah. I think that's more of a danger yeah. in not only this country, in the whole world. And we're not standing up for that. So the Jewish is, it's just an easy hit, I think, to say we're. Is it effective? I mean, do you meet in your daily life in your part of Manchester people who think that Jeremy Corbyn is anti-Semitic and care if he is or not? Absolutely not, no. It's more about everyday life. Food banks, they've not got enough for electric. We've got the OAPs who are not being cared for. We've got children, sure start gone. Everything's gone and they're more interested in everyday life. But as far as what they're looking for is someone, if he can or if he can't, he's like a saviour. They're thinking, well, this guy's got the right mind for the many and not for the few. Because at the moment, everyone, everyone's being squeezed. Mm. And the anti-Semite thing, I think, will eventually go away. 
because nothing's happening from it. Is it it's a, therefore, uh, and uh, that's also my experience, it's a kind of bubble issue, isn't it, mm. uh, in which journalists and the political class endlessly fixate. But out in the real world, where people are short of money, can't make the rent, can't make the mortgage, worried about their job, insecure work, zero-hour contracts, mass poverty and so on, why would people be endlessly fixated on Jeremy Corbyn's exact views on Israel? And I think we've got very savvy with the, with the news and the media. I think now we know they throw it out there, they'll walk away, it's like a bomb in the room, an elephant in the room, and say, is this, is that. They've done it about May, they'll do it about everybody. If they're a threat, I think. I think it's more of a threat that if Jeremy Corbyn gets in, the whole way of life, they fear, not all of us, will change. For the many, not the few, is the well, he promises you that. used. That's yeah. uh, a very powerful uh, slogan uh, coined by Shelley uh, centuries uh, ago. Uh, let's take the gentleman next to you, please. David Lawley, thank you. I'm a filmmaker. Um, I just wonder, though, to answer your question about whether he's the right material to run the country and become the Prime Minister, does he have the conviction? When Palestinians are being murdered in war crimes carried out in front of our televised eyes and fift over 50 are murdered when Yemeni children are being slaughtered by our, our, the bombs which are uh, we are selling to the Saudis where is Corbyn standing up in Parliament and saying uh, these are war crimes where is he standing up and saying why is the government here profiting from war crimes in Yemen and when is he standing up in Parliament to um, cry out against the chief rabbi when the rabbi calls him an anti-Semite uh, in an absolute utter nonsense that he doesn't understand when Corbyn's just suggested that uh, Zionists might not understand irony, which is there's nothing anti-Semitic about. Where is Corbyn, the convicted leader, in that he doesn't stand up enough? That's well, my uh, only criticism. Let, let's be fair. Uh, Corbyn was the first to table a motion in Parliament to ban British arms sales to Saudi Arabia precisely because of the war crimes being committed in Yemen. But the bigger story is that more than 100, in fact 120, Labour MPs preferred to support Saudi Arabia than Jeremy Corbyn. And uh, his shadow foreign secretary, Emily Thornberry, not someone I normally pray in aid, uh, has actually regularly raised the Yemen uh, issue uh, and the fact that even a celebrated fellow like yourself uh, doesn't feel satisfied by that is because the media effectively are suppressing Britain's role uh, in Yemen. But you're on to something on the anti-Semitism point and I argued right from the beginning uh, before he even became leader, when it first started to be raised, when it looked like he might become leader, you have to stand absolutely firm on the difference between Judaism and Zionism, Jews and Israel, because if you don't, they will have mind already. Everything you have ever said and videos that you don't even remember will be appearing. I said that three years ago and almost every weekend for the last three years these videos have been reappearing and he has struggled to deal with them because he's hoist on the petard really of not having made his principal position clear he could have said you may not agree with me but this is what I believe I believe that Israel is a rogue state a terrorist state and I have said so a thousand times and my criticism of Israel has nothing to do with the fact that uh, it's uh, calling itself, at least, the Jewish state. I love Jews. I don't like Israel. That's what he should have said, David, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And he should have stood up when uh, Trump tried to say that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. If he's mm. pro-Palestinian, he should be saying these things in Parliament. You know, and, and when he ripped up the nuclear deal with Iran, where was Corbyn's remarks in Parliament again? There's so many opportunities for him to prove and stand up for what he absolutely believes. Ahmed, you wanted to respond. Yeah, I tend to agree with you a little bit on the fact of, well, quite a lot, on the fact of within the kind of metropolitan elite, they think this anti-Semitism thing 
is really a big deal and that people people who suffer from food banks and who 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 see their their grandmother who can't keep the heating on at night they're the things that people care about but what the everyday person on the street cares about is leadership skills and what does hold resonance is when his own party MPs attack him so consistently and Jeremy Corbyn ignores the attacks many people will believe if this guy can't run a party how can he run a country and that's why I feel like his biggest failure is we sh he needs to contextualize where these attacks are coming from and why they're coming what these people are trying to maintain the status quo they're trying to uphold and what he's trying to fight for without articulating that point the everyday person on the street that does it that isn't engrossed in the news media in the political um, goings on will think this is a leader that can't keep a party together why should he get my vote and um just just one more point I mean we've got to although many of us were distressed by the election of Donald Trump there's many lessons to be learned you can learn more things from your enemies than you can from your friends and the way that the way that he responded to the attacks was, was something that Jamie Corbyn needs to kind of take a page out of that book because what he's doing now isn't working and although um, a recent poll had him four points ahead but I think there was a poll that came out a couple of days ago which he was judged on leadership skills on whether he'd be good a, pri a good Prime Minister and how he's doing as a Labour leader and he's fallen considerably from the last Labour conference and that's because of this staying quiet approach. Well uh, I, I think the imagery you used earlier of putting their fingers in their ears or where I come from we'd say pulling the covers over your head and imagining that because you can no longer see your enemies they can no longer see you is uh, quite a profound mistake. We'll be back right after this. with me, George Galloway, coming from London, talking about Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, maybe, just maybe, Britain's next Prime Minister. We took the camera out onto the streets of London to hear the people's voice. Let's have a listen. What single issue most worries about Corbyn? Would that affect how you vote in a future election? Um, I think what worries me about Corbyn is that he does seem to surround himself with people that agree with him. Um, and I guess that's like... It's fair enough. Uh, no, not really. I mean, like I said, I don't know too much about him. Like, not more than the average person. So, um, I think maybe he's, you could say he's a, a bit too idealistic. But that's just an opinion. Um, what's the most thing which has made me not like him? I guess it's just everything about him. I don't like. The, I feel like he's quite the communism bit's not good. What single issue most worries you about Jeremy Corbyn? He's a Republican. I think he should have been much clearer on the anti-Semitic issue than he was. It took a very long time for the Labour Party to sort this out, and I think all this past summer it's been a major problem. And would that affect how you vote in a future election? No, I would never vote for him. Okay. Ever. He's still the only guy that I'll be voting for. <laughs> it wouldn't make me vote against him, but it raises questions about his judgment in terms of being able to bring the party together. It, it will affect how I vote, as in, like, I always don't want to vote anymore, which is a ridiculous thing, but, I mean, it's not nothing to do with Corbyn, so all the leaders are equally as bad as each other. I support him more than oppose him, but, yeah, I don't think I'll be voting for Labour again. Now, an acknowledgement for your presenter, who correctly predicted the Scottish guy was a Rangers man. <laughs> I knew that from the shape of his head. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, there, I mean, I agree with what Mark and, and Ahmed have been saying and the other commented. I think I want to look at the issue of leadership that one keeps on talking about. Um, if one talks about that the Labour Party is divided, I think the other party is equally divided. There are a whole host of issues. You've got Boris Johnson, you've got uh, David Davis, and the other Brexiters. The chaos that has been created, and Mrs. May was 
pathetic in her speech. She was apologetic. She was appealing to the European Union, saying that, you know, my condition is very difficult. Why do, do you not make trouble for me? Please try to sort of, you know, have a, a more uh, acceptable sort of treaty. So this leadership issue, again, I think, is being blown out of proportion to show that Jeremy hasn't got the acumen to be a good but, leader. But you could see, I mean, I'm rather dismayed by the voices of the public, I must tell you. Sure. Uh, you can see that it's cutting through. It's cutting Absolutely. Through people. Absolutely. Because the more continuous, as you said in your comment, that the lie is put forward, people ex start accepting it. Thanks, Shabir. I'll come back to you. Gentlemen in the middle, let's go to the back benches. Uh, right, uh, right along them almost. Yes, you, sir. Mm. Yes, uh, my name is Joshua Megan from Battersea. I think that the smear campaign, I have quite a different view about this smear campaign because, in my opinion, I know Donald Trump is obviously a much, uh, is a completely deplorable human being. He's on the diametrically opposite end of the political spectrum to Corbyn. But he has one thing in common with Corbyn. He's a, he is a populist like Corbyn, albeit at the other end of the political spectrum. It's not, a, it's not an insult on my part. I'm just making a, a very, very... No, you're right. Analogy. You're absolutely right. Mm. And both are produced actually by the same failure of neoliberal centrism. Yes, it, it, exactly. You know, the smear campaign against Donald Trump, I know America's <coughs> a completely different country to Britain, but it did not succeed. Mm. It, all it did actually, I think, was just buoy the, his supporters, okay, to, to actually take it upon themselves to vote for them. I don't think this smear campaign is at all going to work. I, I could be wrong, I'm prepared to be proven wrong, but in my opinion, the more uh, people are uh, fed, you know, nonsense by the media, I think the more they will, they will eventually build up a resistance to it, a bit like developing an allergy when you get overexposed to something. Thank you very much indeed. The gentleman next <laughs> yeah. to you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm Isam. Uh, I'm a senior social worker. So as the lady was talking about the food bank issues, there's so many issues I deal with and see the in increase in the last three, four years, whether it's mental health, anything. And a lot of policies of Jeremy Corbyn on these issues really going to affect ordinary people and help their life to get better. Coming to the smears, I'm not surprised with the smears. They will continue to get worse. But I, as, as you rightly said, I don't think a lot of people will be affected by it. A tiny minority have already made up their mind they are anti-Jeremy Corbyn. It's not going to make. Majority of people are fed up with the system, not only here, but in Pakistan. That's why the change of Imran Khan, in Delhi where I am from, the popular leader, Avin K. Jirival. I don't know whether people know him. The, the main thing is, people go with your history, what you have st stood up for decades, and Jeremy has, whether it's just stop the war coalition, common issues of people which affects, and he has always been on the right side. The establishment will always be against the common causes of ordinary people, but he's already been on the right side. That's why nobody heard him. Only you, you guys were his friends, and hopefully now we are. I think we got a golden chance in the next election and I'm very, very sure majority of people are going to support him and if God forbid they don't, we will regret it for generations to come. Thank you very um, much. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Shen from Manchester. I think my concern, although I'm a big fan of Jeremy Corbyn, I'm wanting to get into power. My only thing is, does he have that charisma to, to fend off the attacking jury? He always seems a bit unprepared on interviews or like he's defending himself. And rather than take control of the interview, he always seems to be like a bit dishevelled, like they've unracked him or he's like... He's, and you can see him, he's visibly uncomfortable. And, and I think I'd like to see him whether... You know, he's right and men, Tom what I mean, he's not even a support, he doesn't seem, he doesn't appear to be supporting him, but I'd like to see people rally behind him, and I'd like to see him a bit more comfortable on camera, and really take control of these questions that have been fired. I mean, we've heard Mark speak before, and he, the charisma that this guy here in front of us has got is fantastic, and yourself, George, you know, you know how to deal with people, you know what's coming, it's almost like you've prepared the three questions in front, he doesn't appear to be very comfortable and that's my only con and I'd love to see him to say excuse me I'm taking control of this and 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 give some uh, you know of course I back. recognize <laughs> I recognize what you're uh, saying and uh, Tony Blair once said or might have uh, once you can fake the sincerity the rest is easy and Tony Blair got quite some distance he went far uh, with that uh, ability maybe Corbyn is the as it were, the anti-hero. Maybe, maybe he is the unspun, unplugged 
authentic, not very charismatic, not very polished, not very good, not very well dressed. It, if I could do one thing for Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> I'd take him shopping. Uh, and and um, by the end of it, I promise you, he'd look more like the next Prime Minister than he currently does. But maybe that very rough at the edges personality is what people are positively responding to. What do you think? I, I, I think it's when... What upsets me is when you get some Tory... Um, journalists like Nick Robinson going for him and and I think that upsets me because I think this man's for the working class you've got an agenda and you're really back in the Tories and and when I see that when he was defending himself um, recently over laying a wreath that had nothing to do with alleged terror you know it, it, yes uh, he was alleged was like, to have laid a wreath at the and, graves and of uh, the uh, black September uh, people and from the Munich Olympic Games it wasn't that graveyard it wasn't, you know... Actually, they're buried in, in another... In a different country. country. Never mind and, another and, graveyard, but another... Country. Exactly. And, and it was like, it, this person was attacking him, mm. and it was like, come on, Jeremy, give it him back. That's absolute... Yes, and yes, all, uh, yes. Say, of course, on, Jeremy, uh, you, you know? can imagine how I feel during these kind of uh, interviews. But let's go back to the ladies' uh, point. Was anybody in Manchester talking about a wreath in a graveyard in Tunis? I really very much uh, doubt it. Thank you Thank for you. that. Yes, gentleman there. Uh, Musa, I'm from London. Um, obviously, I'm quite younger from a youthful background compared to you lot, so what I'd say... Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is that you have to take people on face value. So I'm from a younger generation, so we look at Corbyn, the one of the main things he says is he'll get rid of the uni fees. So we've got to see it as for this us. This is university tuition fees, yes. which Tony Blair introduced. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> for us, if you're 20 years to 25 and you've got over 30,000 debt, some people psychologically, psychologically can't handle that and don't know how to strive and get out of it. So it's not really made for everyone. So it's kind of like an extra barrier put in front of people. And, and Corbyn's going to scrap those fees. Yes. But... You've got to stick by what he says, but you don't really know until he gets in power what's no, he going to do. he'll definitely scrap them. I so... You can take that uh, for yeah. granted. And, and amongst people your age, was that a big factor in the big Labour vote uh, yeah. in the election? Yeah, that, that was the biggest factor because it's holding everyone back because you're going to do... Un it's, it's stopped me going because why do I want to get 30,000 debt? And you're people are struggling to even save up money to get their own house. Sorry to tell you, it'll be twice that amount. Exactly. It'll not be 30,000, it'll be 60,000. Obviously, some type of jobs like doctors and these degrees you need to, but some artists and that, they don't need the courses that they're putting out. They're just making courses to pay the tuition fees or pay the teachers that don't really need the jobs. That's how I see it. Back to Ahmed. Just, oh, just a question to open up. We've talked about the problems um, a lot. What about the solution? Because... One of the things that surely needs to start being discussed is mandatory deselection. We saw... Now, let's explain. Bear in mind the international audience. This is a scheme by which each Labour MP, before each election, will have to be re-selected by their party members to be their candidate. This is what happens in the United States routinely, of course, before every election, every congressperson every senator has to be reselected before they go into the election. Yeah, because we, this idea that being an MP is a job for life, you get into a safe seat in a Labour-held area, and then you don't have to have regular surgeries, you don't have to be accountable to your constituency, because you know, at the end of the day, they're going to vote Labour, because then they, they couldn't see themselves voting Conservative. That needs to end. And um, we, the, the most clearest example um, was we saw Margaret Hodge, attack her leader, there was, there was, she called him an anti-Semite. She's one of the leading um, Israel lobby. You yeah. got bear, please keep Sorry. bearing in mind Sorry. that the international She's, audience has never heard of Margaret Hodge. Margaret Hodge is a, a member of the Labour Friends of Israel um, group, which is the, one of the key antagonists that are lobbying to, to, to remove Jeremy Corbyn from power. And there was a documentary from Al Jazeera which highlighted the involvement of this lobby. Um, but the idea that there was a disciplinary process against her because she called her leader, her leader, her boss. I, if, I called my, if I spoke to my boss like that, you wouldn't expect me to show up to work on Monday. <laughs> but um, she called her boss a racist and an anti-Semite. With an F word, F with an F I, word. I, 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 it. Yeah, yeah, no. that's right. And she, she 
was was empowered by the fact that the disciplinary process was dropped and then went back and attacked him again. Mm. Meanwhile, this guy, who was part of, who supported the Stephen Lawrence family, Stephen Lawrence, for our international viewers, was a, a young black boy that was murdered on the streets by racists. And this guy supported his family to fight for justice in which three of the three of the five accused, because of the hard work of him and many other campaigners, eventually faced justice. He's kicked out the Labour Party, but Margaret Hodge remains. And, and it's, it's not just about the double standards in that alone. It's about the fact of when you're in a general election, you need all of your MPs to be your cheerleaders, to be saying, if you vote for Jeremy Corbyn, he's going to do, he's going to bring back, he's going to get rid of tuition fees, he's going to um, close down food banks, he's going to do this, he's going to do that. As soon as you put a microphone in front of Margaret Hodges' face, she doesn't talk about tuition fees, she starts calling, attacking Jeremy Corbyn. So yeah, uh, her and, uh, and 172 other uh, members of Parliament. Steve Topol, um, we heard from the younger generation, <laughs> though you're all the younger generation to me, uh, what do you think Corbyn should be talking about? Should he be continuing to allow others to set the agenda? Or should every utterance he makes not be about these bread and butter issues? Uh, uh, if it were me, if somebody asked me, about Israel, anti-Semitism, I'd answer on tuition fees. I'd answer on uh, old age pensioners not being able to uh, put their heating on. I don't care what an interviewer asks me. I'm only on the television for what I want to say. So I completely ignore questions. And if they keep asking them, I keep continually ignoring them. That's the Trump approach that we were talking about earlier. It's more effective, isn't it? It is, yeah, but I think it comes back to Ahmed's point that Corbyn is essentially a bit of a rough diamond, isn't he? And he's not really, he's not trained in these situations, and it shows, because any human's natural response, if someone shoved a microphone in the face and asked them a question, would be to answer it. Whereas it's a trained politician's response, if they're asked a question, to swerve around it and go on to the subject they want to talk about. I, so, I don't see it as swerving. I see it as going forward. I, I'm on your television, and I told you so before we started to talk about uh, the abolition of tuition fees. If you ask me about anything else, I'm just going to pretend you never said it. No, of course. Firstly, I think we need to bear in mind that it's debatable whether he ever wanted to be leader of the Labour Party anyway. I mean, we, we, you think you, he regrets it, maybe? I think so, possibly. I think it's put him in a difficult position. I think you can, if we were to hypothesise what happened, if you like, you had sort of the left rump of the Labour Party all sitting around in a pub with a pint and veil, and they all go, right, who's going to do it this time? And well, look, I'll tell you this. Uh, he asked me at the Trade Union Congress building in Great Russell Street in London before putting his name forward, but when it had been decided that he would, am I doing the right thing? And I was the first person in Britain to say this, if you get enough names on your nominations to be allowed to be on the ballot paper, you will win the leadership. He laughed. Oh, how he laughed. He's not laughing now. <laughs> we are. Final word from you in this segment. Indeed. Um, but I think also the fact that he didn't necessarily want this poses the larger question about the direction of the Labour Party, because um, is he being steered correctly by the people around him? Um, I'm sometimes unconvinced. I have dealings with Labour press office, um, and their agenda is quite often very different to Corbyn's. But I think he's a good man whose principles are right. I just think he's not necessarily 100% convinced he should be the position that he's in now. And I think sometimes he struggles with that, and I think it's noticeable. Final segment coming up. We'll be right back. You're watching Palimara with me, Charles Gallery, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London and discussing, unusually, London, Britain, British politics, the Labour Party and its leader, Jeremy Corbyn. The situation is this. Uh, Theresa May's government looks to be on its last legs. It looks doomed. Now, there may be an interregnum in which the Conservatives choose another leader rather than Mrs May. 
and they may try to limp on for another few months. But there is every possibility of a general election in Britain within the next six months. Every possibility. And Jeremy Corbyn will go into that election more or less neck and neck with the Conservatives. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, in the last election, just 12 months ago, he was 20 points behind the Conservatives when the campaign began, and he ended with the biggest increase in the Labour vote since 1945. So if he goes into the British election neck and neck with the Conservatives, it is likely, it's not certain, that he will win the election, at least being the leader of the biggest party. The betting industry is clear about that, as are, I think, the political class. And that's the reason for their intense, extreme nervousness. They are having to face the possibility that a pro-Palestinian, anti-war leader, who believes in justice for the poor, whose initials are JC, <laughs> that's not sacrilegious, <laughs> and who may be the next British Prime Minister. I think that's a dangerous position for Corbyn to be in. If I were him, I wouldn't be walking in front of any buses uh, or going out alone in the dark. Uh, what do you think? Do you, do you see the British state allowing the possibility of Corbyn as Prime Minister? I think that's an interesting question in itself, that whether the establishment would allow it. And we can see since his election as a leader, twice I must uh, remind the, sort of, uh, the viewers that it wasn't once but twice he was elected as the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, of course the establishment has continuously tried to smear him as we've heard from our wonderful learned uh, guests here. But the reality is that one scandal which they have not been able to talk about because there is no scandal at all, is the financial scandal. A lot of the conservative parties have all kinds of financial scandals, sort of, you know, being, uh, sort of having offshore funds, uh, uh, manipulating the uh, economic system for their own benefit. Cheating their expenses. Corbyn Absolutely. has the lowest expenses in the whole of Britain. Absolutely. So the real issues that need to be talked off uh, about are not put on the agenda because they want to digress the public from the real Jeremy Corbyn as an honest uh, a person who's proved himself to be beyond scandals of this type. Political scandals may continue. And I just want to sort of, on that level, talk about Boris Johnson. You may remember about a month ago, he talked about women in scarf as letterbox, as, you know, sort of uh, 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 bombers at, at, a, at a bank or something like that. And the right-wing journalists, the media, said that, oh, this is Boris, he talks like this, he normally wants to get attention. But the reality is that it's the f f a former foreign minister, prospective prime minister, uh, or, or the leader of the Conservative Party, is talking in this manner. Jeremy has never talked in that kind of language at all about any minority in this country. When Boris Johnson talks about it, and there are many Boris Johnsons in the Conservative Party like that. It's not just Boris Johnson as an individual. The Conservative Party is probably more anti-Semitic, more totally Islamophobic, totally more yeah. sort of uh, against all kinds of minority groups. Conservative Party is the bastion of power, of continuous status quo and for support of those who want to avoid tax as much as possible to pay in this country. And I think on the sort of uh, uh, issue of austerity and economic measures, I think a leaf can be taken from uh, Bernie Saunders, what he is sort of putting forward, uh, 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 a bill in the USA about taxing the big companies so that uh, the poor can be helped i.e. if the government is giving um, uh, food uh, sort of tokens to the uh, 
ordinary people because they don't ha get, get enough salaries or in this country as we have um, you know support for families if they're on low income so the larger companies who are not paying taxes in the respective countries like Amazon like uh, Starbuck like uh, um, other big companies they should be taxed in such a way that the government or the ordinary taxpayer doesn't have to pay One these question. people. The, the owner of Amazon, Mr. Jeff Bezos, or the controller of it, uh, became $164 million a day richer in the last 12 months. Yes. <laughs> well, many of his employees are receiving government assistance sure. yeah. to make up for their low salaries. Yeah. Just, yeah. just think about that. Steve Topple. Yeah, I think my friend here made an excellent point, actually, which we should briefly touch on, is the, the, the sort of scared nature, if you like, of the establishment. I don't know if anyone saw it, but there was an excellent piece um, that Jonathan Cook, the writer, put on his website the other day about um, why this, the establishment is so scared of Jeremy Corbyn. And his assertion was that it is neoliberalism and that form of capitalism is in its death throes, essentially. For them to be so scared of someone who is, at best, a democratic socialist... Corbyn isn't like some rabid communist. He's not even a rabid socialist. His policies are fairly sort of democratic socialism. I mean, he wants to borrow money from um, using government guilts, for example, to um, spend more money in this country. That's not socialism if you're borrowing from capitalism, essentially. Um, and I think it's a very good point. And I think the establishment asks goes scared of Corbyn, not necessarily because of what he represents, but because of the fact that he represents the working people or a lot of working class people in this country. And what Corbyn could then lead to if these people start becoming woke, if you like, and start, uh, start realising that essentially the last 40 odd years have been one massive con that's ripped them all off. I, I personally feel that the establishment fear his foreign policy more than his domestic policy because, as you rightly say, his domestic policy is not very challenging. It's not nearly as left-wing as those famous Bolsheviks, Harold Wilson and James Callaghan. Uh, former Labour Prime Ministers in the 60s and the 70s. They were seeking to nationalise big sections of uh, British industry, for example. Corbyn isn't really going to do that. The real problem with him is that he has a long history of opposition to American imperialism, to American imperial wars, his opposition to Zionism and Israel, his opposition to Saudi Arabia and its dictatorship there. Uh, his opposition to war and subversion across the Middle East. That's what they're worried about. Imagine a prime minister in Britain, the land of Balfour, the land of Sykes and Picot, uh, the, the land of the formation of NATO and so on. Imagine a British prime minister. The land of Churchill. The land of Churchill. <laughs> Imagine a British prime minister being throwing a huge spanner in the works uh, of all of that. I mean, I, I used to argue for a British withdrawal from NATO. Actually, I now think if Jeremy Corbyn was the Prime Minister, it would be a good idea to stay in NATO because you could actually create total havoc for the American <laughs> War <laughs> Alliance <laughs> from uh, yes, being madam. inside. Madam, would you like to... Uh, s you're talking for the North here, talking for uh, the uh, women and talking for the working class. Um, what excites you most about the possibility of a Corbyn government? Is it these foreign policy changes or something more every day? It does come into it, obviously it does. But then that's the bigger issue, isn't it? It's to get him elected and then sort out our, our, some, not all of our problems at once, but at least start making people have hope. We work together again, we're not divided, because it's always them and us when Conservatives are in, isn't it? You know, what they've got, what we haven't got. So I think Corbyn, I, don't, I understood what Shen said, because I wish he would fight back a bit more. But I think he's the quiet man. I think he really is, and I think people get that. Because we're like that. We don't go out screaming and shouting and, you know, taking you people on. You leave that to the likes of us. <laughs> and support you all the way, George, you know that. But the point is, it's got to be a mass thing now, a mass movement. And we all have to talk about it. We all have to go out where we are and talk. And we do. And a lot of people, I mean, a lot. I, I haven't come across anyone who's back in May or the Conservatives. And we go across the board, you know, rich and poor. And so I think we've got to have a hope. 
and that at the moment isn't what we've got. We've got world wars, the, the Middle East is being annihilated, and we're not supposed to say anything. We're supposed to say, well, that's them, this is us. Well, I don't believe that. I think we've all, because we're all in fear. If they're going for the Russians now. And so I think at the moment we should all feel that we can say something and vote somewhere and say, yes, no more. Okay. Just yes. following up on your thoughts on NATO, George, is, is the Labour Party has a history of having a conveyor belt of um, dupes who end up working for NATO at senior level. I'm thinking Lord George Robertson, many of them people like Jeff Hoon, who were the Secretary of State for Defence, <laughs> who ended up working for um, arms manufacturers and, um, you know, Corbyn threatens, threatens that. That whole yes, he does. He, he threatens that revolving door between the British political class and the military-industrial complex. You're right about that. And I think that's what I think that's what the big fear for most of the people on the so-called centre. They've decided that they're centrists, uh, which is preserving yeah. the I'm status quo. Not sure what's quo. centrist about invading and occupying Iraq. Well, uh, it's profitable. I'm not sure what's moderate about that. <laughs> it's good for business. You know, it, it's good for business opportunities. At one hand, you've got uh, the, the, the owner of one of the mercenary companies talking about privatising the war in Afghanistan. And Corbyn's a clear and present threat to that whole business operation <coughs> which has been proposed this week. Corbyn, uh, if you're talking, forget nuclear weapons, because any of his policies on nuclear weapons will just be, will, will be brushed to one side. I just get that feeling. But when it comes to NATO, he has opposed it root and branch, all of its adventures overseas, all of the, uh, as you said earlier, the, uh, the battles and, and wars that have been won and lost. He's, he's opposed because, you know, if we can, we always have to end with discussion dialogue, debate and resolution with, through diplomacy. So why, why don't we begin with it? That's one of his best quotes actually. Uh, all wars end in negotiation and dialogue. So instead of ending in that, why don't we begin with that? Which is why the deep state are really opposed to him. You can see this rolling, rumbling um, resistance to him. Ahmed, uh, I want to I test uh, something that uh, the lady said. Uh, is it a mass movement? I mean, look, are we in danger of ourselves living in a, a, a bubble? Um, there's 600,000 members. That is a gigantic membership. Uh, it's more than all the other British parties put together. Uh, if he called a demonstration tomorrow, uh, he'd certainly put <coughs> uh, 100, 200,000 people uh, on the street. Uh, it's closer to being a mass movement than we've ever had before, but is it really yet a mass movement, and, and could it be? And wouldn't that be necessary, for example, if the generals refuse to implement what Prime Minister Corbyn said, if the uh, secret services began openly uh, undermining him rather than secretly undermining him, which is what they're doing now, uh, you would need a mass movement, wouldn't you? you, and, you and that mass movement would need to be millions strong. Yeah, yeah we're scared to repeat myself, but, that, but a mass movement can only really be formed if the people on top are united. So if you look at any mass movement of people from Cuba to Russia, you, ha you started off with a small nucleus of people that shared an ideology, shared a program, and then convinced other people to join that program. Now what we've got at the top is, I can't even tell you if, with respect if John McDonald agrees with, with, with Jeremy Corbyn on, on most things at the moment. He's the effective number two in the party. Yeah, so, so to join a mass movement, there needs to be, he needs to get people around him that share the same programme. And that way, when, you, when you're united in that kind of programme that you're trying to sell to the people, then you'll start... These people that are the, the people that you saw on the Vox Pops that are a bit unsure, you start to convince them because it's not just one person making the argument, it's five, six, ten, twenty, a thousand, a hundred thousand, and that's how it works. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, see, we see a mass movement on social media. I mean, any time that someone like Joan Ryan or Chukka Amuna, these Labour friends of Israel MP, speak up, you see the, the comments below where they're being attacked yeah. by, by Corbynistas. So there is a mass movement in that sense. I just feel like the leadership... It's not quite mass. Uh, I mean, 
Lennon used to say, never confuse the first month of pregnancy with the ninth. <laughs> <laughs> never confuse the thousands with the millions. Yeah. And I think sometimes we're in danger of missing that point. Last word, please, to Mark Wadsworth, a living martyr, uh, a hero who was crucified by the Israel lobby, expelled, hunted, maligned, you're nonetheless still right behind Corbyn, aren't you? Well, I'm behind the politics that he represents. I belong to an organisation, Grassroots Black Left, and we are critical supporters of Jeremy Corbyn. We don't believe in hero worship or idolatry, despite him being called JC. <laughs> we support anti-imperialism, his stance, his international stance, his anti-racism. And there will be a successor. And I think that certain elements, and I'm going to call them out, in momentum, are actually positioning themselves to be the kingmaker, post-Corbyn. Momentum's now talking about Corbynism without Corbyn. Can you believe? Should that be someone like Emily Thornbury, LFI, Labour Friends of Israel, uh, current shadow foreign secretary, you'd have a very different politics in the party that he's bequeathed to us. And that's why I hold to what Jeremy said to me before he became leader, when we were open friends rather than friends that can't speak in public together anymore. <laughs> he said to me when I asked him, what will your number one priority be when you become Labour leader? I, like you, George, believed he would become Labour leader. Do you know what he said? Democratise the party. You know what that means? Take it away from the way that Blair hollowed it out and turn it back to its members. And if he's able to do that, then I hope we will, in our lifetime, have a left-wing prime minister. It won't necessarily be Jeremy Corbyn, but we will have someone that will fight for the working class, that will oppose imperialism and will stand up to the bully, rogue Israeli state. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's been marvellous. Thanks for joining us.